Hello, everyone. My name is Kay. I use pronouns they, them. Welcome to tonight's book talk on Labor's Untold Story. Without further ado, let's get right into the presentations. Uh, we'll begin with Noah. There, I'll get my uh, camera turned on. Hey, everyone. Uh, the uh, book we're going to take a look at tonight is called uh, Labor's Untold Story. And uh, I'm going to take you through the first uh, six chapters here. Uh, this book was uh, first published in 1955 by the uh, United Electrical Workers. And uh, chapter one, it uh, starts just before the Civil War. Uh, that's uh, 1861. It actually starts at the, the first shot uh, and then uh, goes to the Progressive Era and the Italian Hall disaster, uh, which is around 1913. Uh, this was a, uh, a disaster where, you know, 73 people, most of them uh, children of striking mine workers were crushed to death. So it starts on, or ends on, on that kind of note. Um, I just, you know, I, I think everyone should read this book. If, if, if you know me, I've probably told you to read this book in the past few months. I really can't stress that enough. Um, and it's a book that is uh, kind of hard to present on and cover because firstly, it's, it's already a pretty easy read. Uh, I'm gonna use a lot of quotes from the book when I talk about it because uh, they, they already do a really good job of distilling things down. And then uh, also uh, the book covers a lot. Uh, it jumps between uh, these different workers' movements, uh, different labor organizers, socialists, um, and it also follows uh, the monopoly capitalists at the time. Uh, so uh, the time period of the first six chapters uh, starts with figures like uh, like J.P. Morgan, uh, John D. Rockefeller. Uh, and when it first starts, they are young men. They're profiting off the Civil War. And uh, it ends around the time, you know, that they're dying in uh, their castles and, and mansions. It... Um, it, it also it shows better than I think just about any book I've read that um, how the struggles of labor are tied to the country's history um, and just how fierce uh, the struggle between labor and capital really is. Um, they uh, show that it's you know, it's like a war. You know, there's battle lines, there's troops, there's casualties. Um, they say uh, fundamentally labor's story is the story of the American people. And then they go on, uh, labor's story by its very nature is synchronized at every turn with the growth and development of American monopoly. Its great leap forward into industrial unionism was an answering action to the development of trust in great industrial empires. Uh, and this is a pretty uh, key point to me uh, because I mean, what they're saying here is that it's the ruling class that sets the stage for struggle that they are the ones that initially frame the questions that then labor comes in and tries to answer. <clears throat> uh, so as these giant monopolies are forming and developing, you know, labor's doing the same thing. They go hand in hand. And um, I want to show an example of that by looking specifically at the 188, uh, 1880s. Uh, the 1880s are actually a pretty small part of this book, um, but I think a really important uh, part because it shows really clearly, um, well, well, first, uh, the tools that capital has at its disposal. Uh, it shows how they use the media, religious and political institutions, the National Guard, private mercenaries. Um, and then it also shows how labor responds to the rise in monopoly capitalism and how it begins to um, you know, organize on that basis. Uh, finally, uh, it, it shows the sacrifices that we're building off of today. Um, it's it's uh, throughout the whole book. It's got this really uh, human treatment of struggle, um, and I think it, it's important for that to come through because it, it it ties us in you know to the history in a more um, tangible way that we can understand more intuitively. Um, central to this time period is the growth of big business. Um, in the book, they say big business was the central magnet which drew to it everything else, fastening even its antagonist to it, dictating the time and place of all opposition. Uh, around this time, uh, J.P. Morgan was grabbing railroads. 
Uh, he was uniting finance and industrial capital. That was something that was uh, new at the time. Uh, Rockefeller uh, had just founded the first modern trust in world history. That was in 1882, uh, the Standard Oil Company, uh, which was uh, against the law at the time that he, that he did it. Uh, and they say uh, Rockefeller's trust was a blueprint of the future. Upon this foundation, American monopoly built constantly pyramiding in strength and narrowing in control until it was at last to seek the whole world as its province. Uh, they also say as monopoly increased, it grew more skillful in keeping its opposition fragmented, the labor movement divided. Uh, so, you know, let's take a look at what that division uh, looked like. Uh, in this time period, uh, 1880 to 1890, over 5 million people had uh, landed in the United States. Uh, they were packed in the ships like cattle. Uh, they were often crammed so tightly on the ships, a lot of them died of suffocation. And then uh, when they got here, when they arrived, uh, they were treated just like cattle. Uh, one operator said, uh, I would rather have two men killed than one mule. Uh, and these people, they were brought in to divide people. They're brought in as strike breakers. And there's a few mechanisms uh, for turning them into strike breakers because, you know, uh, initially people, it's not something people want to do. Um, but when they came here, they came here in uh, absolute poverty and they were kept that way. Uh, they say as many as 16 or 17 men and women living in shacks only 12 feet long and eight feet wide. Uh, so, you know, of course, if, if you're kept in those kinds of conditions, if you're kept in poverty, uh, you are forced to take just about any job that you can get. Uh, they were also kept from unifying by pitting them against each other. Uh, an operator describes pitting the English against the Irish and vice versa, the German against both, keeping up a constant war of races is what they say. Um, and then they also don't know the laws. Uh, there's a good quote from John Swinton where he says, uh, they're hired out and put to work in ignorance of their rights. Honest hearted, hardworking men, these poor fellows from impoverished Italy, would not play the part of black legs, that's uh, the strike breakers, if they could help it. So they're in the position of building up the country while at the same time uh, being used as this tool of opposition against labor. Uh, and again, you know, the book puts it perfectly here. They say phenomenal growth, the growth only by violent struggle seemed to be a law of American life. <clears throat> so on the other side of that, uh, there's all of these institutions that are helping uh, sow division. Uh, they say the only co consistent attention paid to the working class and foreign born took the form of journalistic abuse, particularly in times of strikes and unrest. The Red Scare, already old, had been elevated into an institution. What it lacked in exactitude and made up for in violence. To the newspapers, every striker was a foreigner and every foreigner was a communist, anarchist, or socialist, or nihilist. The press was daily punctuated with threats of violence against the working class. Uh, you can see some of those here, like um, you know, decorating every lamppost in Chicago with a communistic carcass. Before reading this, you know, I, I tended to think of the Red Scare as being something from you know the 1950s, but uh, this kind of shows this common thread, you know, that that runs throughout U.S. history. Uh, and then well, one thing that they try to make clear with this is that um, it's primarily aimed at the middle class. Uh, the middle class white Americans, they were often totally unaware uh, to the extent that, you know, poverty and labor unrest was around them. Uh, one example they use is of uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, he said he was utterly unaware of the existence of people unlike himself and his class until the Great Fire of 1872 destroyed the Boston slums suddenly revealing acres of hidden poverty that had previously been hidden. And then, even when they did notice, uh, there were endowments to churches and colleges, uh, and, and that those were to make sure that you had preachers who said that uh, trusts were the fulfillment of God's law. Uh, you had professors who said that uh, corporate violence was the result of natural selection. Um, so, you, you know, at the same time, they were producing an ideology to again, sow division, justify exploitation. Uh, and then just as one last note, um, the depression of 1883 to 85 uh, hit the middle class pretty hard. And they do mention in the book that um, in some ways it made the middle class a kind of a false front. So it was really this very uh, limited segment of American life. It was something that was kind of, um, it was more aspirational than something that 
actually materially uh, existed. And then um, as a response to all of this, during the same time period, uh, you had uh, the Knights of Labor. Uh, they were representing uh, both craft and unskilled workers. Uh, and just to give you some idea of their growth, uh, 1880, they had 28,000 members. By 1886, they had 700,000 members. Uh, you had uh, Sam Gompers, uh, who was a, a, a Marxist, uh, helping Peter McGuire and others uh, establish the American Federation of Labor, uh, which was a federation of craft unions. Uh, McGuire was also the founder of the Carpenters Union uh, and the English-speaking uh, branch of the Socialist uh, Labor Party. I had Lucy Parsons, Albert Parsons, of course, uh, organizing you know hundreds of thousands of you know people uh, across the country, forming the um, the International Working People's Association around the fight for the eight-hour day. And then uh, with depression, there were uh, a lot of strikes to uh, avoid pay cuts, uh, which, uh, I mean, just a short list here. <laughs> you had the Great Railroad Strikes, 1885, 1886. Uh, you had strikes from uh, Michigan lumbermen, New York streetcar employees. Uh, you had uh, bloody battles in Ohio's Hawking Valley, uh, Valley where there were uh, coal miners that were striking against a wage cut. Uh, you had miners that were killed at Cripple Creek in Colorado, uh, fields of Connellsville, Pennsylvania, uh, McCormick workers killed in Chicago, strikers that were shot down in Texas, uh, Illinois militia killed strikers in LaSalle, Vendon, Braidwood, East St. Louis. Uh, the National Guards were called out so much that um, uh, Joseph Buchanan, who was a labor editor at the time, said they, uh, quote, were as much a part of the corporations as their accounting departments. Uh, and then uh, actually most of the murders came from the private army of the Pinkerton Agency. Um, this was something that kind of blew my mind. I mean, when we're talking about an army, it is a literal army. They had infantry, they had cavalry, they had artillery, uh, Pinkerton operatives. They were hired out to corporations for uh, strike breaking, spying, provoking violence, um, you know, just anything that could be used to uh, discredit the labor movement. Uh, so just to uh, kind of uh, wrap up, um, when, whenever I, I'm reading something like this, I am usually looking for some comparison to today. Uh, in the time period that uh, we're talking about here, monopoly capital is still forming, so it's still making that shift into imperialism. And uh, I want to ask uh, sort of my ending question, um, how does modern day imperialism change some of the conditions that we covered here and, and what hasn't changed? You know, what seems pretty much the same? Uh, those are just you know some of the questions that uh, I'm left with, and uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Noah. Our next presenter will be Molly. Okay. Thank you so much, Kay. Can you see my screen? No, I think not. I can. You can? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, everyone, hi. If it's not a, 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 a clean screen, if you wanna mm -hmm. make it a clean screen. Sorry, thank you. Um, yes, hi everyone, my name is Molly. I am a club chair in the Ohio district and I'm an organizer in the um, movement for universal healthcare. Um, my presentation is on chapter 6 through 12 of Labor's Untold Story. The time period of this is about um, 1910 to 1954. So this is, you know, the rise and the height of the Communist Party USA. Uh, it goes through World War I, World War II, and into the Cold War. Um, some of the major themes that I pulled out from this section is, first of all, um, Noah touched on this, the way that the U.S. government conspires with capital, um, that U.S. imperialism is really turned inward, um, whether it's anti-black state violence or anti-labor state violence, and you really see the bolstering of the U.S. military over time in this in this period. Secondly, a major theme was biographies of um, heroic workers uh, and their collective class struggles. Thirdly, the role of racism and anti-immigrant ideology uh, as, as the superstructure, as we talk about it, um, of, of class exploitation of capitalism. 
Uh, fourthly, another part of that superstructure is the role of anti-communism. Um, and you saw a lot of trade unions become controlled by the employers um, and the role that they played in class struggle. Uh, and lastly, I really took out um, some key points of organizing strategy, uh, including the concept of industrial unionism, as well as the idea that struggle, uh, not persuasion, is what convinces workers of the value of any particular demand. And I'll come back to those points of organizing strategy in the end. Um, to begin with, I'm going to briefly run through the summaries of each chapter 6 through 12 uh, and then conclude with some final thoughts so chapter 6 went into the contributions of the wobblies including the labor organizers pictured here and one of the best known of all strikes in american history that of the 23,000 textile workers in lawrence massachusetts in 1912. highly recommend this chapter to learn more about elizabeth Gurley flynn's work Chapter seven uh, described the emergence of the United States as the leading capitalist power in the world. Um, it talked about the peace movement against World War I, which really led to capital and government um, framing, incarcerating, and killing labor organizers, such as Tom Mooney, Frank Little, Eugene Debs, Charles E. Ruthenberg, and many others. Um, this chapter uh, gave a particular expose on Eugene Debs, which I found really inspiring. Secondly, Chapter 7 described the organization of the Great Steel Strike of 1919, led by our very own William Z. Foster, of 365,000 workers in 10 states. It was regarded as a red revolution, and it was beaten back um, by what's called the surefire formula. Uh, as we can guess, it's the employer's use of the red scare. Thirdly, Chapter 7 went into the Palmer Raids, which were in 1920, and 10,000 immigrants and workers were violently arrested overnight across multiple cities under the direction of U.S. Attorney General Palmer and his aide J. Edgar Hoover uh, for, of course, the purpose of seizing the undocumented for deportation as well as trade unionists for communist conspiracy. And lastly, this chapter went into the formation of the Trade Union Educational League, or the TUEL, um, which fought for industrial unionism for the first time in an organized fashion, as well as independent political activity and for the recognition of the Soviet Union by the U.S. government. Uh, as you can hear in those demands, uh, the Trade Union Educational League was communist-led, and this eventually became a left-center coalition with the winning of the support of the Chicago Federation of Labor. I believe this was the first left-center coalition of the Communist Party USA, um, and you can see that the fight for industrial unionism started really early on, um, late teens, early 20s, and it wasn't, it didn't uh, succeed in forming the CIO until 19. 1935. Chapter 8 uh, described capital's financing of the Ku Klux Klan and the superstructure of racism, both anti-Black and anti-immigrant. Um, it went into the frame-up and ultimate execution of the immigrant labor organizers and radicals Sacco and Vanzetti. Uh, Vanzetti wrote in his death cell, class consciousness is a real vital force, and those who feel its significance are no longer beasts of burden but are human beings. Um, chapter 8 was called the Golden Insanity uh, because it really dived into the ways that American workers were dizzied by the promises of big business uh, during the you know, golden 20s and the ways that finance capital used media to distract the working class from class struggle. Meanwhile, conditions were steadily worsening to the point of disaster that we now know as the Great Depression. Chapter 8 also described that transition that Noah talked about uh, of U.S. capital from outright political control of foreign nations to dollar control or U.S. imperialism. It introduced the Major General Smedley Butler, um, who's pictured here on the right, who inf infamously stated, I was a high class muscle man for big business. I was a racketeer for capitalism. And lastly, this chapter described the formation of the American Negro Labor Council in 1925, who fought against anti-Black racism within the labor movement. Chapter nine took place during the Great Depression, um, which, uh, you know, there was this really slow but steady simmering toward the formation of the CIO. And here's where that um, 
organizing principle I, I mentioned earlier um, stuck out to me, especially with this quote. It says, persuasion had not been able to convince most workers of the value of industrial unionism, but great new battles on the picket line did convince them. That is a really important message that we all need to internalize as communists that that it's really not you can you can argue with people all day and all night but if you're not in the streets fighting if you don't are not walking your talk people are not going to join you and that's really the bottom line we have to be where people are active in order to win them to the communist cause um, chapter nine also described the unemployed councils and the role of communists in fighting evictions during the Great Depression. It featured Hugh H uh, Henderson, who was a Negro leader of the unemployed. Um, it also talked about the bonus army protest um, in which there were 25,000 veterans from World War I who gathered in tents outside of the White House and um, Herbert Hoover's US Army attacked them. Uh, and they were demanding their owed bonuses, what they were owed from World War I, and of course, relief from poverty. Lastly, chapter nine described the 1933 longshoreman strike, um, which was led by Harry Bridges, pictured on the right, and the unprecedented 127,000 strong general strike that took place in San Francisco uh, in, in solidarity to the longshoremen. Chapter 10 went into the formation of the Committee for Industrial Organization, finally. Um, by It was formed by eight unions of the AFL with the purpose of working within the AFL. It told the story of how the CIO began when John L. Lewis, on the right here, levied a punch against a conservative labor leader at the 1935 AFL convention, notoriously ending years of stall tactics and driving home this uncompromising demand for industrial unionized, unionism. Uh, chapter 10 also uh, talked about the organizing tactic of the stay in strikes. It was said that between 1936 and 37, 485,000 workers engaged in this tactic. And it gave a particular expose on the victorious sit down at Flint pictured here on the left. So the sit down or stay in strikes is where workers literally stay in the factory or the property where they work and refuse to leave until their demands are met. Um, the sit down at Flint was led by John L. Lewis, uh, again pictured here. At the CIO's uh, first constitutional convention, um, the labor movement for the first time in history barred no one from membership uh, in this national federation because of sex, race, creed, or national origin. They talked about loyalty being judged by successful action in the organizing of the unorganized and the winning of pay raises and not uh, about politics or political beliefs. It was that unity was uh, on the vital matter, matter of organizing, regardless of the politics of a CIO member, official, or union. And I wanna come back to this kind of language and maybe let's kind of think about how this applies moving forward. Um, because uh, during this time, the CIO membership, you know, rose uh, to 2 million in like six months. It was like this huge uh, influx of people. Uh, and meanwhile, the fascist movement was steadily growing as well. There were 5 million people associated with fascist organizations in the US. And of course, we know this is the time that Hitler um, was uh, holding power in Germany, preparing for war. Um, so to close out the book, chapter 11 and 12, um, talked about the brutal reaction of the Cold War after the, the World War II. Um, organized labor during um, World War II increased from 9 million members to 15 million by the end of the war, uh, as well as the demand for socialism grew astronomically across Europe and Asia and in the United States. Um, the CIO and its allies also successfully campaigned for the re-election of Roosevelt to a fourth term, as well as hundreds of pro-labor candidates and congressmen, governors, mayors across the country. This is Sidney Hillman, uh, who is the leader of the political action co committee of the CIO, pictured on the left. And then lastly, after the war, uh, German capitalists were being tried and actually convicted for financing Hitler's war and for profiteering off of it. Um, so overall, monopoly capitalists became very nervous uh, and decided to um, have a you know brutally fight back through the use of the um, anti-communist you know red scare um the surefire formula as i mentioned before and and really going ahead at a scale never before seen um we now call it the cold war 
This was so effective that the CIO itself actually divided itself and um, succumbed to the hysteria. Um, it eventually merged with the AFL to form the AFL-CIO in 1955 um, and, and barred communists in its ranks. So to conclude, my main takeaways from this section. So first of all, um, uh, the one of the things that stood out to me for sure was that the experiences of state violence and oppression and the capitalist exploitation really unites our whole class. Um, this was such a, a deep and um, touching and moving um, expose on the experiences of working people, um, people from all walks of life, um, from, from every, uh, like racial and ethnic background on this call. And I think that we have to understand that we all really have a history and a stake. And, and this is this is our history of, this is our American history, the history of the fight back against state violence and oppression and capitalist exploitation. We all have that in common. Um, and our ancestors died for us to be here today. Um, really important uh, takeaway. And so I really recommend this book, of course. Secondly, um, I really took away this idea. Um, I really felt like that th there was a mistake that was made and, and it, I feel like it continues to be made where we think like, oh, we don't want to talk about our differences. You know, anybody can join our organization regardless of their political beliefs. But I think that that's not exactly what we want to be saying. I think that we need to acknowledge our differences um, and, and say these are our differences and we respect them, but they're not going to divide us. So like if we're in an organization um, and, and we're a communist party member, like bringing that up and educating people about what that means and not just keeping it out into the shadows because whatever it is that makes us different, the capitalist class will ex exploit that and will use that to divide us. And, and I think we should be proactive um, in saying that these are our differences and not our divisions. Um, lastly, the um, takeaway was that um, the thing that I mentioned a couple times that or we need to organize workers in active struggles into the communist movement. So that that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Our next presenter will be Jack. Jack, we Sorry, cannot is hear. Is there a way for me to help? Sorry, is there a way for me to hide my self view? Or hide my webcam? There it is. Let's see if that does it. Okay, you can still see me. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in the brief time that I have, I'm going to try not to, you know, go too long-winded here, but um, I would like to present sort of a compare and contrast of Labor's Untold Story with another related book that I highly recommend all of you read, which is William Z. Foster's uh, American Trade Unionism. Uh, and I just sort of like to compare and contrast these books because in my opinion, even though they have different styles, they take somewhat different approaches to the, the subject matter, uh, and they, they overlap in some areas in terms of the history they cover and they don't overlap in others, I think they're both incredibly complementary books. They kind of give you two different sides of labor history, one kind of from the more kind of somewhat removed historical side, Labor's Untold Story, and then the other side of it, which is um, writings that were produced by one of the most influential communists in the, in the history of the American labor movement, uh, William C. Foster. Um, his writings at the time all of these things were happening and with him playing such a key role in so many uh, significant strikes and developments in labor history in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and he gives us the more of a tactical perspective, a strategic perspective on these ongoing events. There are parts of the book that are that are uh, writing about things that have already happened, but much of it is excerpts from writings of his, uh, say during like the 1930s, for example, where he's talking about um, proposals for how to organize strikes. Um, and so here you get a very you get a very a highly highly detailed and a bit more of a dry perspective. There's there's labor's untold story 
you know, it goes in, there's, there's a fair amount of statistics and, and kind of like, a, you know, just outlining very broad uh, historical forces. But there's also a lot of uh, kind of drama in the story, too. You know, it really, they, the authors of Labor's Untold Story really take their time to highlight specific organizers, um, include some of their personal details. They really try to um, uh, appeal to the audience on an emotional level at many different points to, to like spell out, um, you know, kind of the zigs and zags, you know, the difficulties and also the incredible triumphs of labor history. Um, and Foster is looking at things from more of a dry, uh, sort of very kind of clinical and calculated approach to things. He's very, very, very interested in like the internal politics of unions, um, the kind of the very circumstantial strategies of using strikes and sit downs and such. And so I would just like to compare these a little bit. Um, Neighbors Untold Story was written in 1955. It uh, details labor history from the Civil War up until uh, the second Red Scare. And uh, American Trade Unionism uh, was written, in, it was published in 1947. It was written sporadically from the early 1900s all the way up to the publishing of the book. And it covers basically Foster's life up until that point, which had been, I mean, from the age of 10, that's when he got his first job as an apprentice to a sculptor, which is not what I would expect from Foster. But, um, and then he later gets involved in the Philadelphia Carmen, the street Carmen, which is where he experiences his first strike in the 1890s. And he really, from just traveling around, working every conceivable manufacturing, you know, uh, shipping job you can imagine, he gets a very full uh, experience of the developments of the labor movement throughout time. And so, the book it, it starts with a bit of a narrative of, of himself in the first few chapters you know saying this is where i started this these are my earliest experiences in the labor movement but then as soon as it gets to the sections where he is a prominent leader let's say for example in the trade union educational league in the, 19, the late 1910s uh, and he's organizing the 1919 uh, steel strike in chicago um it's at this point that we really get the you know the strat, the stratish, the, how would you say it? Um, the strategic side of of uh, Foster, and not so much the kind of personal biographical side of him. Um, and that, to me, is where this book excels. I mean, this is really like *Labor's Untold Story*. It gives you the history. It gives you the narrative of the U.S. labor movement in the 20th century. American trade unionism gives you the series of strategies and kind of ideological developments and theoretical developments that happened uh, throughout that time. Um, so this is a book that I highly recommend to anyone who wants to, who is either currently in a union or communist, let's say, um, you want to promote industrial unionism in like sort of how it would currently function, you know, sort of gathering together, otherwise disparate unions for common causes and whatnot. Um, if you want guidance for strategy, if you are in, if you are actively in struggle and you want to, you know, turn to Foster and say, well, what did he do in this in this instance? What did what did the union that he was a part of uh, do, or what did the the party he was a, a part of do in this given situation? Maybe you have reactionary leadership that you're trying to struggle against. Uh, maybe there's sort of individual craft unions or local unions that are fighting each other instead of you know collect you know, forming a collective body to fight the bosses. This is the book that really goes through the, the um, incredible details of those strategies. Um, and so it, it covers a similar kind of time span that, that Labor's Untold Story does, but it, it really like, it, it gives you the, the real like specific details of every little event that Foster experienced. And um, I mean, there, there's lots of different examples in this book, but the one that I love to bring up is chapter 26, which is called uh, Steel Strike Strategy. Um, I'll just be very brief here. Um, 
It was written in late 1936. This is before kind of the little steel strike uh, organized by the steel workers organizing committee um, in 1937. And uh, which also had the Memorial Day massacre. And it was, you know, it was a real intense struggle of the CIO and its related parties to, to organize the steel industry successfully at that time. Um, and Foster wrote ahead of time sort of an outline of what he thought the strategy, the series of strategies should be to like maximize the success of like a coming steel strike. And it's just a, it's an amazing chapter that where he basically outlines all the forces, this is what you've got to do when you got the support from the town, you know, here's how you carry out a picket line. And it, he really gives you just a full sense of, if you're trying to perform, uh, if you're trying to carry out a gigantic strike, like this is what I think you should do to make it succeed. And a lot of the strategies he, he lays out, I mean, they can be applied to the, you know, the sit down strikes at General Motors in 36, like all the, most of the great successful strikes in US labor history, I mean, they really draw, or they have a lot in common with, with the strategies that he suggests in that section. And so the book is just full of that. Um, so how much time do I have left? <clears throat> I think you can finish your presentation. Okay, yeah. So basically these two books are very complimentary. If you're if you are a trade unionist, please read this, you won't regret it. All right. Thank you, Jack. And lastly, uh, we have Robert presenting. everything should be working now. Okay. Yes. Um, so given the fact that several comrades have successfully reviewed much of the book's content, I'd like to focus my presentation on an analysis of the author's methodology. Now, of course, it will surprise no one that Boyer and Marais take a materialist approach to their account of Labor's untold story. That being said, they find their greatest success in their ability to avoid an otherwise mechanistic economistic view of history. The final six chapters of the text critically link the objective economic realities of the first half of the 20th century to the larger political and historical narratives that they elaborate. In doing so, they explore not only the economic conditions in which men and women labored, the oppression that they endured, and the struggle born from these contradictions, but they also introduce us to the practical actors that understood their material conditions not as fixed and unavoidable, but as fickle and thus changeable. First and foremost, Boyer and Marais demonstrate the intimate relationship between finance capital and imperialist expansion. As a result, they identify these phenomena as the causes behind World War I. Moreover, they demonstrate the ways in which World War I transforms the United States into a new imperial power, having long benefited from the relationship between Wall Street and the military industrial complex. This relationship, they argue, forced America into a war that the people never wanted and workers into a hellscape from which many would never emerge. Now, more generally, Boyer and Marais go on to emphasize the contradictions between private capitalism and social production between capital and labor. In doing so, they demonstrate the ways in which U.S. monopoly grows stronger on the backs of working men and women, the ways in which profits soar and wages plummet. In doing so, they draw a clear line from the inequality of the Gilded Age to the economic collapse of the Great Depression, identifying these contradictions as the source of socioeconomic crisis. Finally, the authors underscore a pair of contradictory responses to the Great Depression, characterized by the reactionary fascism of industrial monopoly on the one hand, and the liberatory socialism of the working masses on the other hand. These two opposing currents not only lay the ideological groundwork for the Second World War, but they also continue to dominate U.S. rhetoric going forward. In essence, Boyer and Marais take their readers through the historical contours of labor's untold story, not by way of bourgeois myths of great men and great moments, 
but rather through a complex analysis of economic determinants and their social and political implications. That being said, despite the way in which every chapter aims to connect an economic event with a series of political and historical consequences, the authors continually avoid the one-to-one -one conclusions of mechanistic economism. Instead, Boyer and Morais go to great lengths in an effort to consider the dialectical counterpart to objective conditions, that of course being the subjective leadership of working class struggle. They present their readers with a version of history that has neither been determined by individuals nor has it existed without them. In other words, the struggle for labor victories, for socialist reform, and for radical revolution are not fatalistic promises predetermined by economic relations. Rather, the development of economic relations present men and women with the opportunity to act. These historical figures, large and small, must bridge the gap between the world as it is and the world as it ought to be through action, through organized revolutionary praxis. By means of demonstration, let's analyze one specific example, the history of the Committee for Industrial Organization. Chapters eight through 10 describe America's transition from the Gilded Age to the Great Depression, from an era of immense inequality to one of near universal poverty. Boyer and Morais cut through the bourgeois rhetoric of the 1920s of unending economic growth, the imminent victory of capitalism over poverty, and of the unquestionable brilliance of Wall Street speculators. They show that in reality, immense economic inequality persisted even at the height of prosperity under President Calvin, Calvin Coolidge. In 1929, for example, an annual salary of some $2,000 was necessary to supply the basic needs of an average American family. Yet despite the $2.9 billion in profit that Wall Street investors enjoyed between 1928 and 29, almost 60% of the nation earned less than poverty wages. In fact, of the billions that Wall Street had supposedly earned, the vast majority of profits went to the top one-tenth of 1%. These were the economic realities under which working men and women suffered. However, given the strength and apparent stability within the upper echelons of society, their cries for help were repeatedly ignored. Strikes were broken, open shop policies were implemented, and even the American Federation of Labor, quote, did all in their power to smash the broad United Front movements within their organization claiming that radical organizing was an extension of, quote, Moscow conspiracies. Despite the objective conditions of exploitation and abject poverty, the subjective mentality of leadership, even trade union leadership, inhibited effective organizing campaigns. That being said, Boyer and Rice demonstrate the ways in which the Great Depression changed America's collective conscience and thus made actionable the long existing consciousness of America's working class. First and foremost, the authors provide a straightforward explanation of the 1929 crisis. Quote, while employers kept the wages of most Americans below the minimum needed to supply even the basic necessities of life, they drove their workers to speed up production, thus producing more and more at less and less cost to themselves. As a result of such speed up, and low wage policies, employers saw their profits zooming, and instead of more equitably distributing these, they regularly plowed part of them back into production. Under the circumstances, the American people were unable to buy back what they had produced." Unquote. In essence, Boyer and Rice show the way in which Marx's theoretical analysis had materialized in praxis. How profits increasing and wages decreasing provoked a crisis of overproduction. As a result, quote, there was food, millions of tons of it, and clothing, warehouses filled with it, and warm houses, thousands of them. All the while, countless Americans starved. Their children went to school without shoes and returned without a home in which to sleep. These objective conditions made possible what had long proven impossible for the working class. It was no guarantee that the Committee for Industrial Organization would find itself victorious in its struggle against the AFL's old guard. 
Nonetheless, a combination of economic crisis, strong leadership, and collective action made the victory possible. On the one hand, the decision to work within the AFL to supplant the old guard and to unite disparate factions of radicals, moderates, and fellow travelers proved successful. On the other hand, and perhaps just as importantly, old rhetorical tactics from the opposition now failed. Their subjective will to distort objective reality could no longer mask the contradictions of capitalist crisis. Cries of red scare fell on deaf ears and quote, in the face of charges of communism, CIO workers and officials were largely unmoved. There were no purges, no expulsions, no weakening of the CIO by the CIO, unquote. Membership ballooned from 1 million in 1936 to 4 million at the close of the decade. Even so, none of this was guaranteed. As Boyer and Morais argue, quote, this unity was not easy to come by. Always it was menaced and always it had to be consciously fought for on the premise that without it, there could be little progress, unquote. In essence, capitalist crisis had laid bare the system's inherent contradictions. Objective conditions made visible to all but the most rabid members of the bourgeoisie what was once only clear to the class-conscious vanguard of the working class. However, these conditions alone were insufficient, and without the active praxis of leaders and masses, the CIO never would have overcome AFL conservatism. Its history, therefore, is one of dialectics, of objective and subjective conditions, of economic determinants, and of individual praxis. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Robert. And now we'll move on uh, to questions for the panelists. Uh, the first question being, uh, according to Gallup's annual work and education survey, union support in the United States is 71%, nearing the 1953 peak of 75% when one third of working Americans were union members. Now, which industries or populations are closing that gap between uh, using union supporter and union member today? And any of the panelists can speak. But please state your name. Uh, this is uh, Noah from Southeast Michigan. Uh, if we're talking most recently, uh, my understanding is that it's uh, service workers, healthcare, people in transportation, um, basically uh, everything that was touched by um, the uh, you know initial uh, changes to the economy during COVID, and then you know the rush as uh, as people went back out. Um, I think uh, people were really able to see like um, how uh, absolutely necessary they were and their jobs, and uh, so that's that's where I see the, the greatest. Uh, uh, unionization efforts happening right now. Uh, this is Robert from Colorado. Uh, I, I agree with everything that was just said, and I think it really underscores the message of this book, which is a very important objective crisis made it possible for grocery store workers, for example, to unionize, not only to unionize, but to strike as they've been doing. Um, against King Supers here in Colorado recently. Uh, it, the subjective will, the subjective desire was there. Everyone working in that industry knew how hard the job was, how low the pay was. And it wasn't until COVID really kind of laid that bare, showed how centrally important and vital these workers were for all of us, that they were able to combine praxis with the objective conditions, the objective conditions with their subjective desires. Hey, is it okay if we open the floor for discussion now? That is okay, yes. Luke? All right, I will be uh, scrolling through the attendees list. If you have a question, please uh, use your mouse to raise your hand on the control panel. Uh, then uh, when I call your name, you will be required to open your microphone on your end. Uh, 
I will open your microphone on our end and then you'll be able to uh, state your question. So I'm going to call on Isaac. I'm opening your microphone, Isaac. One second. There you go. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, right on. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is for um, any of the panelists that are in unions. Um, what is your, or rather, let me let me start over. Uh, what lessons from this book have you guys been able to apply in your workplaces and in your uh, locals? Thank you. All right, I am looking for more raised hands. Um, Peter, I'm unmeeting you. Uh, please unmute yourself. Okay. Um, this has been a great discussion about a great book. I really appreciate all the contributions. Um, I worked for three decades for UE, half of that as the managing editor of the union's newspaper. So. On occasion, it was my job to let the publisher know that a new edition of Labor's Untold Story should go to press. How cool is that? I wanted to point out that the Huey was not the original publisher, but rather um, a small left-wing publishing house that went out of business because of the Cold War. But Huey, in the middle of the 50s, in the middle of its own uh, crisis, series of crises, decided that it had a responsibility to the working class to, to keep this book in publication. And so it's been um, something that the UE has taken on ever since. It's still still published, still available from, from UE. Um, that's it. I just wanted to, to say thanks to the, to the panelists and thanks for the party for making this possible. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, Karamo, I am opening your microphone. Please uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Um, hello, comrades. I just had, uh, well, one, two basic questions, and I guess maybe um, making that uh, known. Does the history of the CIO give us any idea as to how to unite a fractured union movement here in the U.S. Second part is how do we unite Change to Win, AFL-CIO, and Teamsters into one unionized collective force? And that's the only two questions that I wanted to raise. I would have just tried to discuss it, but it may be if somebody else wants to answer or can answer. All right. Uh, would it be okay if we went back to the panelists to answer these uh, questions first before collecting more? Sure. So any panelists uh, wanting to respond to any of the questions now, please feel encouraged to do so. So this is Robert from Colorado. Uh, responding to the first question, what lessons um, that I've personally drawn, that my union has personally drawn from this text, uh, very much has to do with the importance of constantly being on the ground. The idea that change doesn't happen through great individual leaders, but through um, mass organizing and mass action. And doing so always with your finger on the pulse, understanding what kind of messages will speak to the objectives, the material suffering that people are experiencing, not because they're hot button issues, not because they are necessarily um, great sound bites, but because they actually speak to issues that people are having. Um, and one such example is actually an email that just went out today from my union. I'm a, uh, a graduate student at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and um, we've been agitating for wage increases, for reduced fees, things of that sort. Um, and the university has repeatedly told us that they simply don't have the money. And if anyone is from the Mountain West listening in, 
You may know that yesterday the university announced a $5 million a year contract for a new football coach. Um, so needless to say, many of the people on campus, many of the workers on campus were appalled to hear that, and the union was able to speak to that concern immediately. Um, and, and we have already organized some, some efforts to, to communicate with um, allies that haven't yet joined the union um, and others on that topic. So it's about being on the ground, being active, and having your finger on the pulse. Would anybody else like to respond to any of the other comments or questions? Um, this is Molly. Uh, I can attempt to give something to um, Karamo's question. Uh, the first question, um, does the history of the CIO give us any idea how to unite our fractured unions in the U.S. today? Um, you know, I mean, the 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 concept of industrial unionism was something that people were fighting for for years and years. And I... Um, I mean, I'm just struck by the militancy with which the CIO started. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, it's a different time. There's no way punching a conservative labor leader would work today. But, you know, that kind of, um, you know, vigor, that kind of strength um, and uncompromising positioning, I think is something that we can consider um and, and you know i'm i don't know exactly what by what by um fractured unions what exactly karamo is speaking to um i think that there's in a lot in a lot of ways um the lab labor movement is one of the most united movements in in the country so i think i i would I have a lot to learn about the current state of um, of of the labor movement and and its in its and what it needs to to move forward to to be successful in in common goals. Um, I you know at the end of the day, you know the CIO was was led by communists, and I think that strong leadership, um, you know, militant leadership. Um, is key in in bringing in bringing about um, this broader consciousness. Industrial unionism is an example of class consciousness. Um, it's not just um, one or two capitalists. It's it's a broader group. And and today, you know, um, that 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 looks like uh, you know the anti-fascist um, you know defense strategy that we all need to work together on and. Um, I guess I think that like strong leadership and and collective action um, that builds class consciousness versus just um, individual um, uh, individual issues, uh, single issues is would be an important um, lesson. Yes. And if I could, this this is Noah. Um, I just want to build off of uh, what Molly said a little bit on that question, um, because uh, sort of moving beyond these um, these smaller single issues and what well, 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 not moving beyond them, but connecting them to a larger picture. Well, one of the things that um, I really uh, took from this book was um, that you can often look to capitalists and what they do um, and and uh, uh, R respond as um, and organizing in, in a similar way. So, so one example being, you know, capitalists they were forming these monopolies by looking across the commodity chain. You know, they would um, make connections between railroads and oil. And I think uh, in organizing, especially in the modern world where we have such complex commodity chains, I think that's going to be really key is looking at how the local and the small connects to the the large and, and the and the big and i think we can learn a lot about that oddly enough from from capitalists and how they built the monopolies in the first place can we can we take another couple of comments uh i see carl has his hand up toward concluding yeah absolutely 
Um, let me find uh, Carl. All right, I'm opening your microphone, Carl, if you could open it on your end. Okay, um, open. Um, first, I want to start with complimenting all four presenters on really well prepared, although different kinds of uh, analysis of, of this book. Um, I, I really appreciate all of that. Uh, this book to me has a lot of personal meaning because uh, I first read it um, over 50 years ago. And when I subsequently became uh, the president of my own local union, I always kept uh, a half a dozen or so copies of Labor's Untold Story in the union office. And when any member expressed some interest in learning about labor history, I would give them one. And uh, so it's something that's been useful for me over the years, although I really hadn't read it for a long time until preparation for this presentation. So I went back and reread the book over the last couple of weeks. And um, uh, then lo and behold, along comes the uh, federal intervention in the uh, planned railroad strike. And I was struck uh, immediately by the parallels to some of what I had just reread in Labor's Untold Story, the, the stories about um, the American Railroad Union and the uh, Grover Cleveland's intervention there, even though he had been supported by labor, even by Eugene Debs, and by the uh, intervention of Congress in passing the American uh, or the uh, labor, excuse me, the Railroad Labor Act, uh, the actions of uh, Harry Truman against the railroad unions in the 19. Uh, late 1940s and, and early 50s. And uh, it, it spurred me to write the op-ed that some of you may have seen in uh, this past weekend's People's World uh, about the, uh, the federal intervention in the railroad strike or the potential railroad strike. I think it's a reminder that books like this are always current. They always have immediate application. And um, this book, uh, it, it's never going to grow old. It's always going to be fresh and useful. And I think that the presentations we heard tonight uh, really point that out. Thank you. All right, uh, Mohsin, I am unmuting you. If you could unmute yourself. Go ahead with your question. I we can't hear you at the moment. Um, there may be a difficulty with your microphone. All right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Kay, I'm unmuting you. If you could. Uh, Unmute yourself. Okay, can we can, can hear you? It? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you to the panelists. I have a question that's sort of about um, like the his, the labor's history since the book was written. So I think it came out it came out in like the mid fifties. So um, two sort of related questions. Um, one is what do you think are maybe some main events that the authors would have talked about if they had written it from say 1950 to today in sort of labor's history and then two um i've noticed it's come up with quite a bit that like industrial um unionism was a, is obviously an integral part of this book it's a pretty integral part of labor history um, but obviously like as technology changes you know in industrial Unions aren't they? they, they uh, sort of industry doesn't doesn't represent most of of employment. So I'm wondering, what do what do you all think about where where is you know unionism outside of industry's place? Are these lessons applicable to unionism within say services? Um, so I was wondering your thoughts about that. Thanks. Uh, 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, would the panelists, oh, we have another question. Um, Scott, I'm gonna open your microphone. Please open, there you go. Um, yeah, this has been a very wonderful um, discussion and presentation that really it makes you feel good about the future of the party and the labor movement. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, one of the things that's going on that I think is really incredibly important for us to take a look at right now is the fact that uh, both the Starbucks workers and the Amazon workers um, are looking to organize for a national contract for all workers um, in their industries. Or, and I think that, you know, if you look back at the cluster and the history, you know, um, uh, there, are, there are some real parallels there. Uh, why, you know, how the CIO was born, et cetera, et cetera. And I just think um, we, we really uh, need to be mindful of these important changes. I'm sure we are, but, you know, we need, really need to be uh, working in those directions. That's it. All right. Uh, if the panelists would like to respond to those questions, uh, please do so now. Toward co uh, including your 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 concluding remarks, please. So we can have each panelist um, speak, maybe in the order of of your initial presentations, responding to any comments or questions, as well as offering your concluding remarks, please. Noah? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I started us off here. I was uh, just, these are very, you know, these are very thoughtful questions. I'm trying to make sure I also put some thought into them. But um, one that struck me was um, uh, about um, sort of uh, moving beyond or you know incorporating some of these lessons but yeah going going beyond just industrial um unions and how uh you know things like the you know, service industries um are part of that and um yeah I, I think um that's that's a very tough question um because i mean service is still part of uh, a commodity chain um but it does operate uh, a bit differently than um industry so uh and uh, again you know on, on um, like someone else mentioned um we are also sometimes working on uh, larger um unions that are operating across you know the the entire country so for instance you know like starbucks workers were mentioned so um yeah i i, I think um to me what that speaks to is that um we are going to have to get more um, complex in our organizing. Um, it's going to happen on the level, I think, of both these um, very large single uh, employer uh, unions, um, and but also um, these ones that are potentially across industry or a across a, a single uh, commodity chain, and that all of these are going to um, interlink, and it's going to take um, some. Uh, uh, good, good organizing to tie them together and to get people to see the, the bigger connections between them. Um, that's about the the best answer I think I have for that right now. <laughs> and um, just to kind of close out um, and maybe hopefully tie some of this to um, to, to my presentation. Um, w one of the questions I had and my presentation had to do um, with uh, in, in imperialism and how the development of that affects a lot of this and i think that that connects with what we're talking about now um you know one, one of the side effects of imperialism is uh, the, the exporting of capital um, which helps you know to give rise to these um you know whatever you want to call them second world semi-periphery countries you know like like BRICS. um and so uh i think you know or, organizing on some level is also going to have to look to these countries um not only for uh inspiration to look at what you know what they're doing there that we need to be replicating here 
uh, but also for you know opportunities um, and to operate in, in solidarity, um, not just you know anti-imperialist, but also uh, you know a positive movement that can work in conjunction um, with parties around the world. I think that's going to be important. I think that's about all I got on that. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Noah, and the other panelists too. And um, I really enjoyed this book and putting this presentation together. I learned a lot, even more from giving the presentation. Um, um, and it's really an honor to be on the call with, um, you know, people who who were alive during this time and and um, who have used this book. Um, um, in in organizing efforts and um, thank you to everyone who's on the call today um, and that you appreciated our our presentations definitely was great to know so um, I wanted to say that I was a little confused by the question about um, the difference between industrial unionism and like um, unionizing service workers um I, I i don't quite understand why that feels so different i think a service is is a commodity and um, just just like any other thing um so i i think that there's a lot more in common than we think um and one of the events of note that i think hasn't been mentioned um is the organizing of the Union of Southern Service Workers, um, the USSW, um, and they, uh, I think, come out of the Fight for 15. Um, and the Union of Southern Service Workers is, I, I, I think, industrial unionism. They're, they're working to organize workers, not just in a single employer, but across the whole service industry. Um, and um, Noah also brought up the point of the importance of internationalism in the labor movement today. Um, recently, I think I read an article about like upcoming AI technology that there um, is technology on its way um, that would enable us to talk to people who speak a different language with like immediate translation. Um, and I think that there's just a lot more opportunities with things like that and the internet um, to ensure that the demands that are that we're forming in our workplace are also addressing imperialist issues. Um, and I think that that's that's that that kind of information and access to the truth of what's happening in other countries um, who are affected by U.S. capitalism. Um, is that opportunity is 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 really important we, and the labor movement will will be seizing on it is seizing on it um, needs to do so more so um, I think that closes out my thoughts um thank you so much Jack I just had a, a few Yes, I just had a few. I'll, I'll be brief because I know we're running out of time, but um, I just had a few words to add. Um, as Noah was saying before, you know, on the, the sort of questions of evolving our tactics to meet the present conditions, um, I think that, you know, especially with the commodity chain stuff, and I think the importance of, uh, you know, the um, places of shipment and kind of like the transfer of raw materials and stuff like that. I think that's still also incredibly important. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, the the 1934 um, San Francisco general strike was led by the longshoremen. I mean, it was it was so violently repressed because it was such a significant challenge to capital. And I and even in our sort of disarticulated chain of of industries now where you know parts of parts of products are made in this factory and in other factories i think that sort of organizing is still uh, extremely important um and when when faced with massive challenges like that when faced with the need to develop new theories um what i love about what foster writes about this sort of thing is whenever he's confronted with an issue that prevails over the movement 
he never allows himself to kind of be stalled by it. He doesn't view the problem and say, oh, well, this whole union is reactionary and we, need, we should start a dual union outside and try to perform some idealist thing. No, he, he sees the essence of the solution in whatever problem he looks at. And so if you love Labor's Untold Story like I do and the rest of my panelists do, and you want to really read into something that fleshes out those conflicts and, and gives like a theoretical basis to how all of those changes took place, then please read William Z. Foster's American Trade Unionism. And thank you for uh, allowing me to speak here. Um, I loved all of the presentations and thank you to all the attendees for your questions. This was, this was a great time. Yeah, so I guess I will uh, I'll close it out. I was the last presenter, so I will uh, I'll just end number one with a thank you for everyone for your questions, for attending, for your interest, for your you know support of the movement. Um, and number two, uh, just encourage, and I sh I'm sure I don't need to encourage those of you that are here because you're doing it already. But I encourage you all to continue the fight. Um, you know when people like like. Uh, George Lukacs discuss alienation and reification. It's so easy for us to look at this massive machine that is international capitalism and imperialism and, and just think, yes, it's terrible. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, I suffer, but there's nothing I can do about it. And it's really important that we all continue to overcome that contemplative uh, inaction, that contemplative consciousness and, 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 and get in the streets and continue the fight, continue the struggle. Um, and I'm sure everyone on this call is already doing that and will continue to, to do that. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for, for the work uh, you uh, did to uh, make this uh, activity uh, worth uh, attending. Thank you. Thank you to Luke and Kay. Uh, and we will do more of this in the future. Thank you very much and good night.